Um, we're going to pick up in our series this morning where we left off last week. We're in a, a series called Dark and Light, and we're looking at all of the things that we need to look at when it comes to understanding this sort of dichotomy, this symbolism that shows up in the Word often, right? We were talking about dark and light, and it's such a great symbol or symbolism or whatever we want to call it um, for the realities that we face each and every day. Dark and light is all around us. And what we've probably realized, what we've come to know, and what we see again and again is that without Jesus, we are all in the dark, but... He brings the kind of light that shreds darkness, amen? He brings the kind of light that shines on the path that he's laid out for us so we know which way to go. We don't have to be stuck in the darkness because we have the light, the light that shines into our lives. It's like when the, the spiritual aspect of things, it, it affects us. And the physical aspect of things, right, uh, affects us. And we're familiar with, with all of that. We're more familiar with the physical than we are with the, the spiritual because we can see it and we can touch it and we know what it is. But the spiritual entered the physical when the Word became flesh and made His dwelling place among us. Gave us a, a standing chance, a, a fighting chance in the midst of all this thing. And, and part of this discussion that we have been into leads us to the realization that every day in our lives, every part of it, is impacted by and affected by both the physical and the spiritual. And we know that there's some component that we just don't have a handle on that we can't fully figure out. That's the, the spiritual part. But why should we care about the spiritual? What can we do about it? And does it really impact me? Because I think that's a fair question, because since we can't touch it, we can't see it, we don't really know that much about it, does it really impact me that much? Well, let's take a look into the Word this morning. So we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn there with me. Ephesians chapter 6, and I'm going to read a, a couple of verses. It starts off this way in verse 10. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may take your stand, stand your ground after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the the belt of truth buckled around your waist and the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This passage you're familiar with, right? You've heard it before. This passage from Paul to the church in Ephesus, the reason he gives this to us, he wants us to understand how much our lives are affected by, how much our society is impacted by, how much the world is affected by the spiritual realm. That's what this is about. The, the things in the physical are not always the real problem. What we're learning, what we're seeing, what we're going to talk about today is it's the effects of the spiritual world. It's the effect that it has on the physical world that's really the problem. So we're affected by it, we're impacted by it, and it's all around us. That's whether we believe it or not. That's whether we think about it or not. It's whether we realize it or care about it or not. It's still the truth. We're being affected by it all the time. Spiritual warfare is all around us. So how do we survive it? How do we deal with it? What do we need to do? Well, this passage says that we require the full armor of God. The full armor of God is what we require for spiritual warfare. And I know that this is a, a passage that we know well, and these are the things that we like to talk about and we hear preached often, but here's something really, really important for us to understand. When you talk about the full armor of God, we need to know what it is, but we also need to know what it is not. We need to know what it is not. Because when we put on the full armor, when we wear it, right, we're called to put this on, it says put on the full armor. It's, it's actually really a picture 
of someone who was living as a follower of Jesus, someone who was sold out wholesale, someone who's been changed. That's what the full armor looks like. When you put on the full armor and you wear it, the full armor of God is a picture of what it looks like to be transformed by the power of Jesus and to live like it. Think about those elements. Think about the pieces. Think about what we read. Because remember, this is not something, the full armor of God, is not something that's available to us apart from Jesus. It's not something available to us if we don't have a relationship with him. It's not something that's been given in and of itself. It's not, it doesn't exist by itself. It's affected by our relationship with him. I mean, we don't have the armor of God separated from and not connected to Jesus. Just look again at the first two verses that we read. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his power. Put on the armor so you can stand against the schemes of the devil. It's not apart from him. One thing we need to know is that the effectiveness of the armor is proportional to our relationship to him. The effectiveness of this armor that we like to read and think about because it's, it sounds so cool and powerful and all these things, it is effectiveness is based upon our relationship with him. So let's look quickly at these, these six elements because this isn't our sermon for today. This is just our starting point. We're, we're not going to talk in detail about the different aspects of it, but let's look quickly at it. Because each element of the armor represents something that's important, something that's essential, something that is meant to strengthen every single follower of Jesus. And it starts like this, the belt of truth. The truth of Jesus holds everything together and everything attaches to it. Just like a belt that goes with your armor. It holds things together and things attach to it. It's the truth of Jesus. The second thing says it's the breastplate of righteousness. So you've got the belt of truth, and then you have the breastplate of righteousness. So you you put this on, and it's not our own righteousness we're talking about. It's his righteousness. It's the righteousness that comes from Jesus. His righteousness, righteousness is imparted to us in our salvation. And we need to take that righteousness and and put it on because it's the thing that protects our very being. It protects who we are in him. When we are seen righteous in the eyes of God, it's because of what Jesus has done for us. But when that's the case, we can be, we're able to face things differently, challenges differently. We can step out in confidence to face all of those challenges, all of those things that are happening. This righteousness, like a breastplate, protects our very being. So we've got this belt of truth. We've got this righteousness that's like a breastplate for us. And the next thing is the gospel of peace that's fitted on our feet, right? Symbolism is big in the Bible, isn't it? So think about this. The gospel of peace fitted on our feet like shoes, like footwear. When you're in combat, when you're wearing armor, you need footwear that makes you stable. You need footwear that protects you. You need footwear that allows you to move and be nimble, to navigate the gospel of peace, the gospel of Jesus, the good news brings peace into our lives in two different ways. Two different kinds of peace. Our salvation removes the enmity between us and God. We go from being a rebel to a child of God. We're at peace with him. And the second kind of peace that the gospel brings to us is through the reconciliation that Jesus has made possible for us. It puts us in this place of wholeness and in peace where we can feel secure regardless of what's going on around us. So this idea that that the gospel of peace gives us stability, allows us to navigate and do the things that we need to do, right? The symbolism is is great in this passage. We've got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the gospel of peace for our feet, and the next one says it's the shield of faith. Your faith has to be like a shield, or your shield is your faith. What does the the faith in Jesus protect us from or shield us from? from, well, whatever the world can throw at you, right? Isn't that true? Isn't that what it's about? When you have faith in him, when you believe and entrust your life to him, it doesn't matter what the world can throw at you. When you stand behind the faith that you have in him, it doesn't matter. Look what the verse says. It can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Flaming 
arrows are being shot at us by the evil one. This is spiritual warfare showing up. That's what he's talking about, flaming arrows. So your faith, your understanding of God's promise, that's the thing that enables us then to stand firm because of what Jesus has done. Behind our faith. If you need a a shield to defend yourself, what does that tell us? It's a simple reminder that spiritual warfare is happening all around us, and it's real. Right? So so we're getting all this this amazing symbolism. It's the the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the the peace of the gospel that gives us stability and this, this, this shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation protects our head. It's a helmet. It comes from the salvation that we have in Christ. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus and not by our works or our thoughts or anything else. It's because of what he's done for us. And when we know him and his salvation, it enables us to think differently, to act differently, to make choices differently. So our thoughts and our desires and our plans are guarded by what we've been given in Christ, our salvation. It changes us. It makes it different. Right, so we've got all of these things. It's the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel that gives us stability, the faith that we stand behind like a shield, and this helmet of salvation, and finally, finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Right, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We have been given the Word of God to protect ourselves and to advance the cause of the gospel. We've been given this sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to help us to grow in our relationship with Jesus and to fend off the attacks and the advances of the enemy. Right? That's the conclusion of the armor, the description, the symbolism. I think it's good symbolism. I think it helps us to visualize it. But do you see what it's describing? It's a picture of the transformation that comes from knowing Jesus It's a picture of the strength that we have in him because of him, because of what he's done. That's what the armor is all about. It's not this magical thing that we're handed and given and we go off on our own. Because again, back up. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It doesn't say anything about open the box, put that stuff on and go out and you'll be good. It says in his mighty power. This transformational aspect of your life that is described by each of these elements means something. It's who we've become. It's who we are because we're connected to him, not because we're apart from him. This armor, if it's not because of Christ, if it's not connected to him, doesn't do us any good because it's not going to work. It's not even real. This is a reminder about the importance of our faith, how we must continually and ongoing have faith. We don't just have faith one day and then we're good right? Faith is something that is ongoing. It's something that we actually do. We have faith. We believe. We trust. These are action words. These are verbs. Once we receive what Jesus has for us, we don't just stop and sit back and say, oh, this faith was great. But instead, we've got to keep on going. We've got to get up. It's action. It requires action. If faith is not an action word in your life, then you probably don't really have faith. Because it's continual, it's ongoing. It's what drives us, it's what motivates us, it's what makes us who we are. Faith and believing and trusting in Jesus, that's what we do. It's what we must do. All day, every day. Because it makes us who we are in him. It gives us the ability to stand firm, to rely upon his mighty power, to be transformed, to look like someone who's wearing the full armor of God and to live like it. Because it shows up in our thoughts and our actions. It shows up in, in just our decisions, right? It shows up in, in what we do. Without it, we don't stand a chance because without faith, without an ever-growing kind of faith, without a relationship, we don't really have anything and we're out there by ourselves alone with no armor, with nothing to protect us with no ability to stand against the attacks of the enemy, the schemes of the devil, and the fiery arrows that are being shot at us. We don't have any leg to stand on. We put it on display, our faith, every day, all day, so that everyone else can see it. 
right? Part of our faith is so that everybody can see it. It should be obvious to other people. If we continue to believe in the promises of God, it should be obvious to other people. Putting on the armor then is a symbol that you have been changed and that you trust Jesus to be with you in the battlefield. Right, that's what it shows. That's what it looks like. It's, it's the recogniz- recognition from everyone else that, that we trust him and what he's done for us and how that changes our lives so that we can stand with him, behind him, beside him in the battlefield. We're not alone because we can't do it on our own. You see, the full armor of God is not about what you can do. It's a reminder of what you can't do alone. And it's a reminder of our continual need for God's grace and mercy in every part of our lives. You remember the passage we've talked about now a couple weeks ago, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. We talked about uh, we can only chase the giants out of our lives because of what Jesus has done for us. Otherwise, we're hiding in fear. It's only because of what he's done that we can chase the giants out of our lives. We're, we talked about David. David didn't need to wear any armor David was a representation of Jesus in that story. We were not David. We're the people who were afraid of the giant. David drove the giant out so that we could then be the people that he called us to be. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Right? That's what Jesus says. And you know, all of this talk and all of these, this symbolism and all of this understanding of what the armor is and these things that are supposed to happen in our lives, you know, they have to be real. They have to be authentic. You can't just pretend. You can't just go halfway. It's not just I can say the words and it works out okay. Or I can, I can just wish it on myself and it must be okay. That's not how it works. It has to be authentic. Or you know what? You end up like the seven sons of Sceva. You ever hear that story? You ever hear the seven sons of Sceva? It's in, it's in Acts chapter 19. And I'm going to bring it up today because I think it, it's really helpful in understanding why it's so important that we have an authentic relationship with him, that we have an authentic connection to him, that it's real, that it takes effect, that it's doing something in our lives. You see, in, in, in Ephesus, the people were following Paul and they were seeing the amazing things that he was able to do. And they were watching him day and, and night in his ministry and, and people were being drawn to it. And they were seeing miracles the miraculous, just things happening like they've never experienced before. And they thought it was just something that they could do as well. They wanted to figure out, how can I possess that very same thing? How can I, 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 I own that? How can I learn how to do that? It must be sort of like a trick or, or something that I can just learn. But here's what happens. This is Acts chapter 19. Some of the Jews who went out driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. They didn't have an authentic relationship with Jesus. They weren't able to put on the full armor of God because it didn't mean anything to them. It hadn't changed their life. They haven't been impacted by it. It wasn't based upon their connection to and their relationship with Jesus. So words and and, and wanting to be this and wanting to own it and thinking it's some sort of magic trick didn't really work out well for them. And it's not going to work out well for us either. Because our success in spiritual warfare is directly tied to the faith that we have in him, in Jesus. We don't own it. We can't win with it if it's not connected to him. And if if we're out there on our own, we're in trouble. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, this passage starts with for a reason. You see, the armor of God is necessary, but it only exists in our relationship with him. I'm going to look at another verse today, and I'm going to get to our main verse for today. Just give me a minute. We'll get there, but I want to look at one more just to kind of set the stage for us, and this is in 2 Corinthians, so you might already know where I'm, I'm going with this. 2 Corinthians, somewhere. Second Corinthians, 
chapter 10. Here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I just want to look at two verses. Here's what it says. Verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We live in the world. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. In fact, the ones we have can demolish stronghold because they're divine, because they're from God. We can't plan to do battle the way the world does and expect to win it. Well, how does the world do battle? Let's think about that for a minute. How does the world do battle? How, what do you see every day? What do you experience every day? What's going on every day? How does the world do battle? Through intimidation? Through division? Through cancel culture? Through identity politics? How does the world do battle? By normalizing sin? By rejecting the truth? What else happens in the world? This, this hyper-individualism? This relativism where there's no longer any absolute truth, just my own truth? How else does it do? It distorts God's creation. It tolerates injustice. What happens is that the world rejects holiness and godliness and embraces this worldliness. That's a rejection of everything that God gave to us. The battle that we're called to is not to do what the world does or to rely upon the things that the world does. We can't enter those battles. We're not going to do well in those battles. We can't stand up to those things unless we can put on the spiritual armor of God. We can't stand up to all of those things unless we're able to swing the sword of the Spirit. We can't stand up to all of those things unless we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Because how else are we going to do it? We need to get ourselves in the right place in our lives, in our relationship with him. If we want to have success in spiritual warfare, we need a foundation before we can even do anything else. Spiritual warfare requires a strong foundation. Spiritual warfare requires us to take it seriously. Do you see it? Because none of this is about what we can really understand. Right? None of this is about sort of a, what's a general consensus that will allow us to win? Instead, what we need is to take a different path, to be counterintuitive, to be countercultural. We've got to do things differently. We've got to do things in his mighty power. We need to take our stand in his mighty power so that we can resist the attacks of the enemy. The basis for all spiritual warfare is not found in Galatians in that passage about the armor. The basis of spiritual warfare is not found in 2 Corinthians, this whole idea that we have to understand that we're not fighting flesh and blood. It's, that's not the basis for all of it. We need something before we can get there. We need something that's found in James chapter 4, and this is our passage for today, James chapter 4. And here's the thing, this passage doesn't discuss demons and angels or warfare or armor. It's, it's not about victory uh, through battle uh, with, with these forces. Instead, here's how it starts. It's about victory through surrender. Victory through surrender. Now, wait a minute. Aren't those two things opposite? Victory through surrender. How can you win if you give up? How can you win if you surrender? Because surrender doesn't lead to victory, does it? I would say, oh, contraire. According to James, it actually does. Because remember the, what we're talking about here. Not like the world. Not the same as the world. We want to make spiritual warfare into this, this thing, this big thing where, where we can go out there and sort of be this hero. It, it, it sounds like this, this, uh, this, something that's just sort of interesting and compelling and exciting. But we don't stand a chance if we don't have a foundation. And here's what James says our foundation ought to be. Starting in verse 7, he says this, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. 
unless we are in the right place with God, we don't have access to the armor. Unless we're in the right place with him, we don't have access to the divine weapons that demolish strongholds. If we're not in the right place, we don't have access to it. It's not for us. Because we are in the grips of the enemy living in darkness, subject to the rulers and the authorities of this world. Until we get to the place where we stop rejecting um, the, the, the path that God has laid out for us. Because it's not until we then firmly reject the darkness and embrace the light that we stand any chance against the enemy that we can't see and that we can't understand. Right? It has to start here. It has to be our foundation. You don't just run into battle with all these things that sound really great and powerful because you can't get there without starting here. This passage in James is about repentance. This passage in James is about submitting to God, who's the creator and sustainer of all things. This passage in James is about recognizing who God is and who we are not. This passage in James has to be our starting point if we want to be successful in standing up against the attacks of the enemy. It's about recognizing that our sin is the very thing that is preventing us from enjoying what God has for us. Our sin is the very thing that is keeping us from a real relationship with him. It's the kind of thing, uh, our, our sin, when we want to have a, a, a both feet firmly planted in the darkness in the world, makes us vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy, to the things uh, of this world. And there can be no spiritual victory until we surrender our lives to Jesus. There can't be. I mean, if you back up just one section here in James chapter 4, move up to verse 4, it says this, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? This says that friendship with the world, worldly living, equals being an enemy of God. That's sobering, that's impactful, that's important to look at and think about. Friendship with the world means that you're no friend to God. But why, why would that be so? How could that be? You see, because embracing the things of the world by embracing the things that the world calls good is a direct rejection of the things that God calls good. Because they're not the same, they can't be the same, they're not congruent, there's no overlap. What God calls good is very different from what the world calls good. I mean, last week we talked a little bit about it. We said that we are called to be followers of Jesus. We are called to be a church that is countercultural, that is not like the culture we live in, that is different. The church has always been called to be different than the culture that we live in. You see, you can't be part of the dominant culture and the counterculture at the very same time because that doesn't make any sense. We also said that our job as the church, as followers of Jesus, our job is to redeem what is redeemable and call out the things that are not. Recognize it, see it, say it. On the subway it says, if you see something, say something. As followers of Jesus, we're called to, if you see something, say something. We need to pursue the things that shine light into the darkness, not the other way around. And when you begin to live that way, when you begin to do that, when you let your light shine into the darkness, you will get opposition to it. It will come from your friends. It'll come from your family. It'll come from your neighbors and your coworkers. And it'll even come from people that you don't even know. You will all of a sudden get all kinds of opposition from all different places. You know what that is? the outworking of spiritual warfare. That's what happens. When we do our part to shine light into the darkness, we are engaging in spiritual warfare. Think back to Ephesians chapter 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It says that's what our struggle is against. Right? All of those things that we can't see, that we can't touch, that we don't really understand because we can't see them and touch them. They're, he's telling us that's what our struggle is against. Spiritual warfare is all around us and it affects us directly and indirectly. 
So how do we deal with it? How can we be prepared for it? And how can we avoid the dangers that come with it? Well, we have to recognize it for what it is. And we have to be able to put on the full armor of God, right? To be uh, prepared for it. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. But before you can even get to that, before you can ever begin engaging in spiritual warfare, you need to have a foundation and you have to have a relationship with him. You have to be connected to the source of the only power that can beat the forces of evil. The source of power that found in our relationship with Jesus. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because it's not up to us in our own strength and our own power. It's not up to us just saying some kind of words or, or, or playing or pretending. That's not going to work. Ask the seven sons of Sceva that we read about. If it's not authentic, it's not real. And you can't do anything with it. It's not going to work. Friendship with the world leads to being an enemy of God. We have to make a decision. Where are you going to stand? Where are you going to live? What are you going to do? What, what's going to define you? Because you can't have a foot in both camps. You can't have it both ways. You can't just know about it and talk about it. Instead, you have to be transformed by it. That's what makes us who we are. I mean, look at our passage one more time today. In James, he says, Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. It says, when you surrender, he brings you victory. It says, when you surrender, you win because of God, because of what he has for you. And it says, the devil will flee from you when he realizes that you are standing in God's power, when you are clothed in the full armor of a transformed life, when you have an empowered life, when you are using divine weapons that destroy strongholds. It says, he will flee from you. Come near to God. He is calling us. He is welcoming us. There, there's no exceptions to who's called and who's welcomed. Everyone is welcomed. Will you come in? Will you take that step? Will, will you be willing to humble yourself before God? We read multiple places in, in Psalms and Proverbs and Job. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. To shun evil is the beginning of understanding. How can we be wise, have godly wisdom if we don't fear the Lord what does fear of the Lord mean? Not being afraid of God because we, we have to shudder and hide, but we fear God by recognizing who he is, that he is God and we are not, and that when we know him as God, who is above all things, who loved us so much that he came himself to save us, it helps us to see things differently, to do things differently, and we will exude godly wisdom in our lives by recognizing who he is and living like it. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. I mean, think about that amazing vo the verse. Come near to God, and he'll come near to you. You don't have to do anything other than come near to God. He didn't say, well, once you mem memorize the Bible and can name all 77 books, then maybe you can come near. He didn't say, once you learn a bunch of these prayers that I have put out there, then maybe we'll have a conversation. He doesn't say, once you learn how to do all of these different things, once you learn how to do whatever, or go through these rituals and these thoughts, then we can have a conversation. That's not what God does. And that's what differentiates our God from so many other things out there. Is that he welcomes us in to get to know him immediately. He calls us in to find him. He puts himself right where we are. He doesn't build these walls. He breaks the walls down and invites us in. The Holy Spirit breaks down barriers so that we can have access to God. He calls us to himself. He wants us to know him so much so that he sent himself. He came to where we are to give us that chance because God so loved the world. He didn't come to condemn it but to redeem it, to restore it. He invites us to come follow him, to believe the good news. To repent and believe the good news, Jesus says. That's what James is reminding us that we need to do. 
And when we do, He will lift us up. We are called to repentance to see the things in our lives that are preventing us from all that He wants for us. To see the things in our lives that are keeping us tethered to the world. To see the things that, are, that have a hold on us. Because when we repent, when we stand before Him, when we put our faith in Him and accept the amazing grace of salvation, it says, He will lift us up. He will lift us up in His strength and in His power so that we can take our stand against anyone or anything. Right? We read it, the flaming arrows of the enemy, the strongholds that are out there, the powers and authorities that we don't really know, understand, can't see the things that are affecting us and impacting us, the spiritual things that are affecting the physical things and the material things in our culture, the things that are coming against us. How can we ever stand against those things? We can only stand against those things in his mighty power. Otherwise, we're defeated by them, taken over by them, held captive by them, and we become them. But we're called to be different than that. We're called not to be part of the world, but to be part of the kingdom of God. Because he has a plan for our lives. He has a plan for our future, and most importantly, he has a plan for our eternity. Those aren't just plans that come and go. Those are promises that he's made. You see, God makes promises that he keeps. God doesn't make a promise unless he intends on keeping it. And God has always kept his promises, and he always will, because that's what we know about God. And that gives us the strength and the, and the, the desire and the need and all of those things that come from knowing God. But we need God, but we desire God. We love God because of all the things that he does, but most of all because of who he is. And that's what differentiates him from everything else in the world. The world makes all sorts of promises, but never intends in keeping any of them. Every promise the world makes usually comes out to be a lie. Everything that looks good in the world is a counterfeit of the good things of God. What we find in the world is that they take the things of God and twist it and distort it and change it so it's no longer a good thing, it becomes a bad thing. You can see it all around you. Every area of godliness has been distorted and twisted and changed, and it's no longer godly, it's worldly. And we need to set ourselves free from all of that by embracing the power of God that is found in our relationship with Jesus. That's why he came. In his strength and in his power, we can take our stand. The devil will flee from you, resist the enemy, come near to God, We can stand in the face of all these things without fear, in confidence, not as the world does, but with divine power that breaks strongholds. I mean, that's an amazing verse. Divine power that breaks strongholds. Because no matter how strong the hold is on you in some area of your life, we all struggle with things, and some of us are so bound up by certain things in this world, and we hide it. We don't tell anybody, and it's a secret, and we're ashamed of it, and all these things are holding on to us. But in him, we have divine power to break that stronghold. It's not anything we're doing. It's everything that he's doing. None of these things are available without him. We can break the strongholds in our lives when we submit our life to him and ask him, thank him. Praise him and embrace what he has for us. I'm going to ask the, the worship team to come back up. I mean, if, if we're here today and you're thinking about strongholds and, and this, this hole of, uh, that the enemy has, or if you're thinking about these areas of your life that are more in the darkness than, than in the light, if, if that's you today, if you're ready to be free from that, I want to pray with you. If that's you today and, and, and you're ready to tell him, Lord, I'm ready to be free. I'm ready to let go. I'm ready to get out of this this dark world and stand in the light. If you're ready for that today, I want to pray. Or or maybe you're wanting to recommit to that in your life. That's what we're here for. That's why we come together. That's why we study the word and, and hear the word. And that's what we know about him is that Jesus came that we might know him and see him, that he could reveal God to us. That's why he came so that we can stand firm on those promises that he didn't come to condemn us but to save us, he came because he loves us and he wants us to be part of what he's doing. So that's where we are today. So take a moment and reflect upon your day or on your week or on your month or, or even your year. Think about where you've been. Think about where you're going. 
Think about all those things that are happening around you. Is the darkness becoming overwhelming? Is the darkness too much? Do you feel like you can't do it alone? Do you feel this need? But you're not sure where to find the answer. But what we know is that the answer is only found in Jesus. So let's take a moment and either commit ourselves for the first time or recommit ourselves because he's the God of second chances and he calls us in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for what you've given to us. Lord, we look around in our lives and we see so many things that we need to get rid of. We see so many things that are holding on to us. Lord, our sin keeps us captive to the world. And we know the wages of sin is death, but we also find that the gift of God is salvation in Christ Jesus. Lord, you call us to repent and believe the good news, to come follow you. Lord, this morning we want to follow you. Lord, we're sorry for the things that we've done. We're sorry for those areas in our life that we just won't let go of. Lord, help us to break free. Lord, this morning, thank you for our forgiveness. Thank you for what you've done. Lord, thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray now that every single one of us in this room, every single one of us here, Lord, we want to look to you and thank you for your willingness to forgive, for all that you went through that we might be set free and forgiven. Lord, right now we commit our lives to you. We see you for who you are. We're grateful for what you've done. And Lord, I pray now that you will empower us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, change us, let us be connected to you. Lord, we humble ourselves before you because we know that you can lift us up. Lord, I pray right now for every single person that you touch them, their hearts, their minds, their lives, their families, their individual situations that you will speak clearly to them, Lord. You will open up doorways for them. Lord, that you will reveal your plans to them into which direction they should go. Lord, that you have laid something out, that you've called us to shine light into darkness. Lord, today we're ready. Today, Lord, we say thank you. Today, Lord, we say use me. Today, Lord, we say send me, Lord. Lord, touch our lives. We're grateful for you. We love you. We know that you love us even more. Help us now, empower us with your spirit to go out different than when we came in. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, we love you, we do this in Jesus' name, amen.